chapter 54 tonight and 55 as we continue on through the book of Isaiah. We're getting close, but not there yet. We will be there in a little bit. Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about God's ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts our thoughts, and how much higher and greater are his ways and thoughts than ours. And that is uh, the truth. If we were to understand that God being in existence from eternity, uh, never was created and created all things and knows all things and is in presence of all things, then we can pretty much trust what he has to say in his word and know that what he has said has been tried, tested, and proven definitely by trial and errors the children of Israel and, and today the church itself. And the struggle is doing the word of God, knowing that uh, God's ways are just so much higher than our own ways and our own thoughts. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But in this chapter here, we see the restoration of Israel and the wife of the Lord. This is one of the first times that we actually see a phrase where God calls Israel his wife. So in that relationship that they have one with another, God views Israel as a wife. Uh, we see the book of Hosea. Uh, God talks about Israel being a wife and how they have committed adultery against the Lord um, and he tells Hosea to actually marry a prostitute because that's how God feels about Israel. His wife is committing adultery against him and so forth. And then we come to the New Testament and we see Jesus Christ talk about the church and John the Baptist saying that, he, that the church is the bride of Christ. And John the Baptist is what? What's John the Baptist? He's the best man. Right? He's not a part of the church. He's the best man sitting and viewing Christ and the church being wed together. And so uh, interesting how you take the Old Testament and the New Testament and the similarities that are there. You just know it's one book flowing from uh, Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. So Spurgeon said this, Try and suck all the sweetness that you can out of this chapter while we read it. The personal application of a promise to the heart by the Holy Spirit is that which is wanted the honey in Jonathan's wood never enlightened his eyes until he dipped the point of the rod into it and tasted it try and do the same thing this chapter is the wood wherein every breath or broth doeth drip with virgin honey sip taste and be satisfied and so Spurgeon really love this chat this chapter here and I, I love it too but we should really do that with the whole word of God right I mean, it is like honey to our lips. It is tasty. It is energizing. And it is something that we need for proper health in our lives. In this chapter, we're going to see a song singing about a barren woman and the events that happen around the barren woman. Uh, also, we're going to see the offspring of God's inheritance as a nation and that, again, the Lord, uh, his maker, is making Israel a, a, um, a wife and then we'll end with no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So verse 1, as Israel will be restored like a barren woman who bears children. Uh, sing, O barren, sing, O barren, you, you who have not born. So you get the idea of a woman who is married and she has no children, so she's barren. And in Israel... To be a woman and have no children actually was a curse. They viewed it as a curse. Uh, they would actually mock you and ridicule you because they would consider you like an old maid and you haven't brought forth children because they believe that God's children bring forth children. They believe what Genesis uh, taught about what a whole relationship between a man and a woman was and that was to bring forth uh, those people into the kingdom of God, to populate the kingdom of God. Um, I was just listening to a message uh, by um, Tony Perkins, and he was talking about marriage, and he was talking about how in the, in the Old Testament and the very reason that marriage is about is not so that a man and a woman come together and please one another. And in fact, it's not even pleasing, uh, pleasing to the individuals, though there are some benefits to being married. But the whole real purpose and foundation of marriage is to bring forth offspring to, in, to populate the world with Christian men and women. That's the whole purpose of true marriage. And when we understand that purpose, then we understand that there's a plan and a purpose of God in our relationship. And that really should be our goal is to meet those relationships 
uh, to the point where we're raising up good offspring to the kingdom of God. So it's not a good thing to be barren in the tribe of the children of Israel. Break forth and sing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, saith the Lord. And so the Lord likened the captivity of Israel as a barren woman. We know that they're in captivity. Babylon has them. And the Lord is saying, you're not being fruitful because you're into captivity. You're in captivity. You're in bondage. You're in shackles. The enemy has you. And that's so true uh, for us even today. Not necessarily, not necessarily that we're in captivity to some foreigner, but we're in captivity to sin. And if we continue to live in sin and continue to, to please ourselves in that sin, then in a sense we become unfruitful. Unfruitful. Because we're so involved in sin. Now, what is fruit? Well, Galatians tells us what fruit is in chapter 5. You know, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is, and he starts with love, joy, and all those things. But there's fruitfulness. Uh, when the religious leaders came to John the Baptist, you know, John the Baptist says, show me the repentance and show me the fruit before you get baptized. There has to be fruit. And so we are striving for fruit as Christians. You should be looking for fruit in your lives. There should be some sort of fruit in your life, in every aspect of your life, fruit in your marriage, fruit in your church, fruit in your dealings at work. There should be godly fruit taking forth. Just like a fruit tree brings forth oranges or apples or grapes, whatever it is, we should be bringing forth fruit. If you're involved in sin, you can't bring forth fruit. You're in captivity and you're going to be barren. You're going to be wasting your time fighting and arguing. You're going to be battling against the flesh and the enemy and there's not going to be any fruitfulness. And that's why it's so important to get your mindset on God and be faithful to what God has called you to do in that relationship. Galatians 4.27 says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor for the desolate, has many more children than she who has a husband. So Paul uses this scripture in the book of Galatians. He says in verse 2, Enlarge the place of your tent, and let them stretch out the, the curtains of your dwelling. Do not spare. Lengthen your cord and strengthen your stakes. Now he's talking about restoring that, uh, the, the restoring that relationship that God had with the children of Israel here. That is going to come in the future. This will bring forth the hope to the remnant of Israel. And so he's trying to bring them hope, those that are in captivity there. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your desolates or your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities its inhabitant. In other words, you, you will be fruitful again one day. Yet you're in captivity and you're in bondage, but I'm doing a work and you will be fruitful in the future. You know, the population of Israel today is 8 million in 2014. 8 million people that are living in Israel today. I, I would say that's pretty fruitful. And God has kept his promise. Uh, that's a lot of uh, Israelites there in, in Israel. In 1948, Israel had only one city in which the population exceeded 100,000 in 1948. They're in Tel Aviv and Jaffa. Today, 14 cities have population of more than 100,000, of which six have more than 200 residents. They're in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Jaffa, and they're expanding as the population continues to grow. Now, this says something, doesn't it, about God's character towards uh, Israel, is that he loves them, and he doesn't forsake them, and that he's doing a work through them in spite of themselves. Now, they're not perfect. They're not holy. They're not pure. In fact, they're they're in bondage because of their sin and idolatry. But God did not take his eyes off of them because he made a promise to them, right? That's contrary to what Calvinism th preaches, isn't it? Because Calvinism th says you have to be pure, you have to be holy, you have to be excellent before God's going to use you. And that's a lie of the enemy. None of us are excellent. None of us are pure. Um, I was listening to a message by Chuck's uh, wife this past Saturday and she was sharing a little bit about Chuck and how he viewed the people out there. He was sharing the word of God and he was sharing about the righteousness uh, and the godliness that we should have in our lives. And he said that all of a sudden he looked out there and he saw people that he knew and he saw the struggles in their lives, the sins in their lives, and he, he saw them and all of a sudden he had a heart of love for them. And he, he started thinking, these people need to be loved. 
I mean, they're, they're falling short of God's promises. They're falling short of that walk. They're struggling and so forth. And he just saw them with compassion and mercy. And so he began to tell them how much God loved them. And that came about God's, uh, Chuck's philosophy. Just, just love your sheep and feed your sheep as best you can. And just let them know that God loves them and let God do the work through the Holy Spirit in their lives. Uh, because there's a lot of hurting people. None of us here are perfect or holy. You know, and all of us deserve to um, be separated from God for eternity. You know, but there are those that are like that Pharisee that stands on the corner, you know, and and says, Lord, I pray and I fast and I do all these things, you know, and they talk about their own righteousness. And in reality, they should be like the poor sinner who's on the corner saying, Whoa, am I, Lord, have mercy on me. You know, because I don't tithe all the time. I don't, you know, have the righteousness. And that's the heart that God wants to see, a contrite heart, a, a heart that's bent on God and knows his own self very well. So Israel will be restored like a widow who is rescued from her reproach. Verse 4, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. So because of Israel's idolatry, she was put to shame. Like a married woman who becomes a widow, there's shame there, and God will remove that shame and restore her in the right relationship to himself is what he's saying there. So again, removing the shame. Who does that? God does that. We can't do that. God is sufficient to take care of us, past, present, and future. For your maker is your husband. So there we go in verse 5. The maker of Israel is the husband of Israel. So Israel is the wife to God himself. And that speaks of a relationship. Husbands, look at how God treats Israel. Look at how God treats Israel. That's how we ought to treat our wives the same way that God treats Israel. Now, it's sad to think about Israel and how they treat God. We need to think about that part, ladies, and and how you treat your husband. Uh, How would you treat God? Uh, We don't treat God very well, even now that we're in a relationship with Him, but God is just so faithful that He doesn't treat us the way that we treat Him in that relationship. The Lord of hosts is His name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. In the scriptures, we see Israel as the wife of God here. And this verse can be taken as a promise to many of, uh, many of you women that might be hurting, forsaken, divorced, uh, don't have a husband if you're single. God wants to be your husband. God is your husband. And that goes for the church too. We are, we are God's Uh, in every aspect of the term. God wants a relationship with us and we should make Him number one in our lives. And so when our spouses or when others can't meet our needs, if you're single, God is the one that meets our needs. He is our husband. He is the one we're to please. He is the one that we're to have that ultimate relationship with. And that's what God wants. Because ultimately when we get to heaven, we won't be in in marriage anymore, right? Uh, We'll all be single. There's not going to be given to marriage and we'll all be in that relationship with God himself and so we have to really uh, stir up that relationship with God and so the principle is true God will supply all our needs emotional needs and rescue us from any disgrace and shame and any others that have forsaken us this is the promise that the Lord will meet our needs when our when others forsake us doesn't uh, leave us in a place of second best, you know, or or leaves us hanging. He takes care of us and watches over us. That's a promise that he gives to all of us. For the Lord has called you like a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife, when you were refused, saith the Lord. So God explains his restoration to Israel in verse 7. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you. For a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have my mercy on you, saith the Lord, your Redeemer. Now notice the two words. You might want to highlight them in verse 7 and 8. Mere moment and then for a moment. Compared, you know, I, uh, Peter said that, that, that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So God's timing in heaven uh, is very slow compared to our timing on earth. We can go a whole thousand years and it's barely a day past. 
So it hasn't even been a day for us in our relationship with God. None of us are a thousand years old. You know, so if you break that up, and I broke it up one time, it's like minutes, minutes in our relationship. So what we think is a long time to God, it's just been, it's been a very mere moment. And God is reminding them here, look, I've only left you for a moment. You know, yeah, I gave you to Babylon, but it's only been a moment in my time, in my economy. And I'm working something great out. I haven't forsaken you. My face hasn't turned against you. I'm still there. And it's only been for a very moment. The forsaken there is in the present tense. And the great mercies are in the future tense. And so it's past, but now I have mercy and grace for you in the future. And so they can trust God. That God will be merciful and that he will be kind. You ever think that God has left you? You know, there's those times where all of a sudden you're going through something. You think, where is God in this moment? And God hasn't left you. He's he's told us that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That he'll always be there for us. Because he's working a work in your life. And so we feel like he's left, but it's for a mere moment. And we need to allow God to do his work in our lives. And when we feel tired, forsaken, we should recognize that it's only for a moment that our emotions and our sen- senses are sensing that God isn't there, but in reality, God is there being who he is. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would, be, would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. So he gives us an example of his commitment to Israel there. Like with Noah, I'll show you a rainbow to remind you that I'll never flood the earth again. And I'm committed to keep that promise with you. Uh, We can depend on God's promises and what he has promised us to come to pass. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. For my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, saith the Lord who has mercy on you. So the kindness of the Lord is more certain than the mountains and the hills. Those will be removed first before the kindness of the Lord is removed from you. That's encouraging for us to know that heaven and earth will pass away before God's kindness will ever pass away. In fact, God's kindness and mercy will never pass away. It's always there for us and extended out to us. And in fact, we partake of it every single day. When we wake up in the morning, it's because God is having mercy and kindness to us every day. Not that we deserve it, not because we're special, but it's because who God is in his nature and character. He loves us. And this is a covenant that he has with Israel, an everlasting covenant of peace. Now we see his promises of prosperity, peace, and protection here. Again, I find this interesting because if you really look at the life of Israel from from Genesis, or let's look at it from the time of Abraham all the way to Malachi, and then all of a sudden 400 years of silence, and who knows what happened during that time. It was so bad that, that, that God is not seen For 400 years, that's how bad it was. And in a sense, he left them for a moment. And then all of a sudden, Jesus enters into the whole scene to fulfill God's promise. But you look at the whole life of Israel, and they're trouble from day one, aren't they? They're trouble from day one. I mean, there's, there was a time when, when Israel was, was following the Lord. They were in that relationship. God was blessing them. And there they are in the land of Moab. And the king of Moab got a little concerned because there's Israel, a million people out there, and he's wondering, my kingdom's done with. And so he calls Balaam and says, what do I do? And so Balaam says to him, and I'm cutting a lot out here, but I'm getting to a point. Balaam tells him, this is what you do. You send women down there and you entice the men and they will commit fornication with these women. Well, their God is a holy God and a pure God, and he won't stand for it. And so he will begin to judge them. And that's exactly what happened. They committed fornication, and God had to judge them. And so many of them were judged by God, and Moab felt better. And so you look at something like that, and you just go, Wow, God, you are merciful because you forgave them and you restored them. I think of Moses and and Korah there on the mountain and and the whole scene there and how they rebelled against God, created a calf, and yet God was merciful to them through that whole thing. And you see king after king after king in Babylon, the Assyrians, and yet the people of God just continue to go into idolatry, fall into worship and so forth, and God has just continually been merciful to them. Now that's the Old Testament And you see God's mercy through his people, Israel. 
And then you come to the New Testament, and Jesus, who represents God, who is God in the flesh, and he's come to fulfill God's plan, but he raises up what? Not 12, uh, 12 nations, but he raises up 12 disciples. And guess what? They have the same type of problems as Israel. They weren't perfect. Uh, that church was not perfect. Within the church, they had a Judas Iscariot. Within that church, they had fightings. Who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God? You know, uh, They struggled there. And it wasn't even until the Holy Spirit came in in Acts chapter 8 that all of a sudden there was power you know, for the Holy Spirit to do a work. But even then... Paul had to rebuke Peter because Peter sided with the Judaizers. And you read that in Galatians. Because he started listening to the Judaizers and they were saying, no, some people have to be circumcised. We need to keep some of the law. Peter's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes some sense. And then Paul says, no, no, that's not true, Peter. And he had to rebuke him. And this is after the Holy Spirit. And so, um, again, here's the encouraging thing. We're messed up, guys. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. And when we stand there and judge others, you're making a worse mistake. What we should be doing is keeping our eyes on God and how good He is to us and be faithful to Him and Him alone. I don't serve you. Boy, if I served you guys, I'd be gone a long time ago, believe me. Because I don't need this garbage at times, you know? I would just be gone. I serve God and I'm going to be faithful to God and God alone. And that's how all of us should be, is faithful to God and Him alone. I don't even serve my wife. Boy, if I served my wife, I'd be gone. I would have been gone way long ago before I left the church, <laughs> you know? Because we struggle at times too. But I don't serve her. I serve the Lord by serving her. And I'm committed to the Lord. And it's the Lord that eventually will deliver us. I'm not going to compare eternity with God to 34 years of marriage you know, and the struggles that we have in it compared to eternity, nor am I going to jeopardize my relationship with God because of my sin. You know, it's sad. I just read a, uh, a Calvary Chapel pastor <clears throat> serving in the ministry as a church and so forth, and it's so sad that he would post something that saying his wife just left him. With another man. Now, did she jeopardize her relationship with the Lord? She sure did. Whether she's saved or not, who knows? But just like that, yeah, for a pastor. And then I know another pastor in Texas, same situation happened, where she just didn't couldn't take the ministry and took off with another man. You know? Jeopardizing your relationship with God, that's a scary place to be. And we need to be careful that we're not serving our husbands or serving our wives, but we're serving the Lord. And that's where the strength comes in. So we see these promises. He says, O oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempests and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundation with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystals, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear from the terror, it, 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 for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coal in the fire, who brings no weapon formed against you, shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, saith the Lord. If you think that your righteousness nor or your victory in this life comes from yourself, it's not. It comes from the Lord. Are you righteous? Yes, you are. Because it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that you're righteous. It's not your own righteousness. None of us are righteous in our flesh. But we are righteous before God because of Jesus Christ. His blood has been imputed to us, and so you are righteous. Are you poor? Not in the flesh. But we are pure in Jesus Christ, because He is pure. 
Are you holy? Yes, because Jesus Christ is holy and has given you His holiness. It is all His work in our lives. And so when we stand before God, God sees Jesus in us, who is pure, who is holy, who is righteous. And as He says here, their righteousness is from Me. Was Israel righteous? No, but they were righteous in the eyes of God because He gave them the righteousness. And it says at the end there, thus saith the Lord. And in fact, it's a way of saying this is true and you can believe it. Now we come to chapter 55. An invitation to receive the glory of the Lord's restoration. This is talking about the kingdom age. And in this chapter, the Lord is calling Israel to come unto him and those that are thirsty. We've heard that phrase before with Jesus Christ, come unto me. Those of you that are thirsty, and I will quench your thirst. He will make an everlasting covenant with Israel. And he will also talk about his word that will not return void. And the mountains will birth forth and sing. So we have an invitation of receiving blessings from the Lord. An invitation to be richly fed. Look at verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come to the waters. I like that phrase, come to the waters. What he's saying here really is, if you are really thirsty, then come to me, and I will fill you. I will quench your thirst. Now, we understand that picture phrase, because we have been thirsty before. On a hot summer day, and you're working hard, and you're sweating, and you're losing fluids, all of a sudden you get thirsty. And so to go get a glass of water with ice in it and drink it, it feels pretty good. You feel satisfied, you, you, you cool down, and it's a wonderful thing to feel that sensation of coolness taking place in your body. And what Jesus, or what God is saying here, is that if you come to me, if you're thirsty for me, if you're thirsty to hear me, if you're thirsty to receive from me, then I will give to you according to your thirstiness. John seven thirty one. Uh, on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out to everyone else and said, if anyone thirsts, come to me and I will give you something to drink. Now, what is it saying here, really? What it's telling us is that we need to be thirsty, right? Because God wants us thirsty. For who? For Him. For Him. For His Word. Because that's how we know Him. Now, we live in a day and age of technology. We can access thousands of messages on YouTube or on iPods and Internet. I mean, you can get a message on this chapter alone from all over the world by some of the greatest speakers in the world. And you can get the same message by just simple people reading it because I've seen them and they're literally on YouTube just reading the message out there and I've seen hundreds of those literally on a, a makeshift computer with a microphone and you hear the echoing going on and they're just reading the word if you are thirsty for the Lord if you are thirsty for him you will receive from the best of them and from the worst of them, even if they're just reading the Word of God. Because it's not how they put it, it's not how they make it flowery with their words and their descriptions, which are wonderful, but it's the Word of God that we are thirsty for. And if you are thirsty for that Word, then God will quench that thirst. Now, this is a struggle in the church itself because you get people that are looking for a great teacher to teach them. But what they're looking for is a man with a special talent of teaching and storytelling and making them laugh and feel good and all those things. They're not really looking for the simple Word of God. They're not thirsting for the Word of God. And so you have these people following People, and that's not good. We should be able to receive from the Lord even if we just read the Bible by itself. Just as you read at home and you read it, you should be receiving from the Lord if you're thirsty. If you're thirsty. Now this, this kind of reminded me of this uh, on Sunday because I see it, I've seen it in this church in the past and it's going to continue to happen. It's, it's not going to change because people are people and, and this is just how we are. 
But if we recognize it, we don't have to be that way. Um, I recognized it earlier on, so whoever I'm listening to, even those guys that are on the microphone and their microphone is just kind of echoing, you know, and, and they're talking, I can still receive from them because I'm receiving the Word of God. I'm not looking at them and who they are and how they present it. I remember I went to a Gideon dinner, and uh, their guest speaker was, was an evangelist. So this old guy gets up there and... He looked like he was actually from the streets. He looked like a, a bum. had an old suit on, brown polyester, you know, with a tie that didn't match and kind of worn out shoes and so forth. So you could tell he was one of these guys that denied himself and he just wanted to continue to preach the gospel. And he got up there and, I'm, you know, from looking at him, I could understand people saying, why am I going to listen to this guy? But when he taught, it wasn't flowery. He just kind of shared a little bit of his testimony. He shared the scriptures and I was ministered to by those simple words of this simple man because it was the word of God that I wanted to hear. It was thirsting for God's spirit to minister to me. You know, and then I can listen to someone like uh, David Jeremiah, Chuck Swindoll, and you know, and you're like, wow, how do these guys speak like this? And you get ministered to them, from them, because of the word of God. What happens is, is we get comfortable in our church that we tune out we no longer thirst for what God is saying and so we are no longer listening to the word of God and we start listening to the man and we start picking and choosing and nitpicking his words and so forth and now we're just critics out there and we're not hearing from God anymore we're not thirsting anymore and I see that about every two years to three years, we start getting comfortable in the church and we tune him out then. And we really need to work on tuning him in and listening to what he is saying to us. I was just talking to a brother this afternoon and um, they were really ministered to uh, by a couple of things that I said last week <clears throat> about uh, the Spirit getting taking a hold of you, uh, a revival and so forth, and they were kind of examining their own life and they said, that's not how it, it happened with me. But, they said, it's interesting that the Spirit ministers to me by someone on the radio, and then all of a sudden someone else says the same thing, and then all of a sudden you said the same thing, and it was like, whoa, the Spirit was really directing me in that area. That's how He works, because you're listening and thirsting to hear from God instead of a man. Uh, Sunday, you know, usually when you get new people in, those are probably your best critics as a pastor. You know, uh, where are you at? Are you teaching the Word of God? Are, are, are you teaching it simply? Are you, you know, are you feeding them? And usually they're the best because they're coming into a church. They're trying to figure out, do I want to come here? And so they're what? They're listening. They're tuned in. They're thirsting to hear the Word of God. And so we had a, a new couple here. And the guy, uh, after the service, we were talking for a while. And he said, oh, I just want to let you know. He said, I really enjoyed the message and the fact that you were very clear about each verse, what they meant, and it was very clear, the application, everything that was there, just very clear. Uh, You spoke it clearly. Uh, It wasn't all over the place and so forth, and I, I just like, I was surprised because I don't hear that. Now, that was encouraging. I don't need that, but it was encouraging that I'm on the right track and that he got ministered to. Now, I've also heard from people after several years that all of a sudden will come up and say, I don't get fed from you at all. You know, I don't get fed from you at all. Now, I don't say this, but it's because they're not listening anymore, nor are they thirsty. And they need to thirst. They need to thirst for the Word of God because it doesn't matter how the person presents it. It's what he's saying true by the Word of God. And that's what we should be listening for. We really need to be listening for that. God wants us to thirst for Him in every situation. You're listening to the radio, you're reading a book, you're hearing a a sermon from the pulpit, or watching on YouTube. Thirst for Him and say, Lord, minister to me, speak to me, share with me something so that I can take it away with me. If you're not, I encourage you to really... Pray about changing that so that you really hear from God. You're really thirsting from God because He will answer you. He wants to answer you. He wants to quench that thirst. 
He says, you have no money, come by, eat. Yes, come by, wine and milk, without money and without price. And so, it doesn't cost you anything but to thirst for God. You know, there's no amount of money that He wants from you. He just wants you to thirst for Him, and He will quench you. Verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and and your soul delight itself in abundance so again just what i've been saying there i mean we we don't have to go and 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 buy the best you know um i'm not a book buyer i'm not a book buyer you know all these books that come out by some of these people you know and even on biographies and so forth and maybe this is a fault of mine you know who knows i'm a bible reader I love the stories in the Bible. I love getting it straight from the source. You know, someone will come up and they'll write a book about a certain topic and great and wonderful and they'll quote you the scriptures and then they'll tell you their stories and then they'll tell you what they think it says and so forth, which is fine. And I can get ministered to by some of the insights, but I'd rather go to the Bible and read it from there and get it straight from God's mouth. I don't have to go spend a lot of money buying a 20 or a $30 book, you know, to hear someone's story when I can hear it straight from God's mouth. So I don't have a lot of books, you know, though I've read a lot of books, especially uh, Chuck's books and, and commentaries more than anything else. But all these other ones, I just, I just, I don't see why I should spend the money. There was a book out a while ago called The Prayer of Jezebel. It was a big thing, a big thing. And then it turned out it was in air after examination. Uh, it was an error because they were saying, if you pray this prayer of Jezebel, God's going to bless you. That's not true. Just because you pray the prayer of Jezebel, it doesn't work like that. You know, uh, putting it in a box, packaging it up, and here, here's blessings. Do it like this. You know, it's like the guy who went, went out and evangelized, you know, and it was just a move of the Spirit, and people got saved. So he came back to church, and everybody was excited. What did you do? He goes, well, this is what I did. You need to write that down. And so he wrote it down. You need to put it in a book form. You need to have classes. You need to lecture. And he went from church to church and church to place. But he never did it again. And so he was busy selling books and lecturing and going church to church. And we missed the point. <laughs> he wasn't evangelizing, you know. And we want to package everything together, and that's what that book was about. Pray the prayer of Jezebel, and God's going to bless you. You know what? Just read the Bible and God will bless you. Do what's in the Word of God and God will bless you. We've already read that in the previous chapter. What God is speaking about here is they're buying bread, they're spending their wages to be satisfied, and this stuff will never satisfy you. God, believe it or not, hates commercialism. He hates commercialism. The great Babylon is all about commercialism. Go to Revelation and the merchants by the sea, all commercialism. The world, commercialism. He wants us to live simple, humble lives. But we are so involved with all this commercialism. And I understand it because I'm involved in it too. I live in this world and I know all the enticement of it all. But he simply wants us to hear him, to sit at his feet and not be so hungry for the world and the culture and what's out there. We, we shouldn't be doing that. And why do we spend so much money on things that we think will satisfy us? We think they will satisfy us. If I just buy this, I will be happy. And people literally think that. If I just buy this, I will be happy. If I have the latest of this, I will be happy. Why doesn't God make us happy? Why isn't He enough? Why do we have to buy all those things to be happy? If I could just have her or if I can just have him, I will be happy. Or if I can have him this way or have her that way, you know, I will be happy. You'll never be happy because commercialism is designed to make you want all the time. I saw a, a Facebook video and it was uh, revealing how the commercial world sells you. And they talked about, it's just one thing that I remembered. Remember back in the old days, you used to be able to make a cake in a box? You just pour, pour it, you know, and mix it, put it in the oven, and you got the cake. It was just that easy. Well, it wasn't selling. It wasn't selling because they realized that people felt that they were cheating. 
because all they did was open the box, pour it in a bowl, shake it, and put it in the oven. It was ready, and they felt like, if I go tell them I made this cake, it didn't seem like I made this cake, and so, so I can't lie like that. It feels wrong. So they weren't selling. So how did they get them to buy? They added one little instruction. They left out the eggs and told them to put the eggs in it. And so they said, put two eggs, stir it all up, and then now they felt like they made the cake because they broke two eggs in it and it sold like crazy. See, the commercial world knows exactly how we think and what makes us buy certain things. The aisles in the stores, they're set up and they're designed to make you buy things. The, the, the way that the flow goes, uh, usually everyone always starts to the right, if I remember right, start to the right, and they start you know, going around that way, and so they put the stuff in front, and usually the last items that are just cheap and make them the most are on the counters, the little items that are you know two bucks and so forth are all right there, get you to buy them and make a quick uh, buck off you there. You know, they know exactly what they're doing, and it's designed to make you to want more, and you're never satisfied with it. Never. Only the Lord is the one that satisfies us. And that's what he's saying here. Incline your ear. Listen. He, and come to me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. We need to hear what the Lord is saying. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you, sh you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Again, you look at Israel and, and how successful they are today, the technology that they have today, the weaponry that they have today, and how nations are coming to Israel for help in all kinds of different areas. God is fulfilling his promises to them. Now we have an invitation to forgive, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So Isaiah basically is giving us a sense of urgency for God's people to seek the Lord because he is available. But there will be a time when he's not available. If the rapture takes place, that's it. It's done. Those that are left behind, they've got to go through the tribulation period. It, it's, it's done. They can't ask the Lord to come and take them now. And, and when they accept the Lord, if they accept the Lord, the Lord's not going to rapture them out. They've got to go through the tribulation period. So now's the time to seek the Lord. Now's the time to call upon His name while He is near to us today. Now, it's not saying that God separates Himself and we need, you know, from time to time. That's not what it's saying. It's saying the urgency to call on God. That's the important thing, is that we need to always remember to call upon Him. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, notice those two things in verse 7 here. First he says, let the wicked forsake his way, and then the unrighteous man his thoughts. So his ways and his thoughts. His ways is talking about the way he lives his life. We are to forsake it. And then our thoughts, we are to forsake our thoughts, our unrighteous thoughts. And we are to return to the Lord's ways and the Lord's thoughts. See, this is true repentance, which really means just turning from our own ways, turning from our own thoughts, and turning to God's ways and God's thoughts. That's pretty clear. If we have a lifestyle that is contrary to God's ways, we need to stop. We need to turn. If we have a mindset that's contrary to God's ways, then we need to change that mind, don't we? Because there's two requirements to this repentance. Forsake the wickedness and our sinful thoughts. We need to forsake those things. The wickedness may be demonstrated by our actions, our ways and how we live, but righteousness here can be found in our very thoughts, how we think, how we think about things. Very sinful. 
See, the battleground for, righteous, for a righteous life is often found in the minds and the thoughts. That's where it starts. So, even though we say we've never murdered, as Jesus said, or God said in, in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not murder, and we could say we have never murdered, but yet Jesus says, if you hate your brother, what? You've committed murder, because it's in the thoughts and then it's in the heart, and the action could come at any moment. I mean, there's been... Uh, crimes of passion where people just have gone crazy and killed somebody because they allowed their emotions and so forth. What was in their mind and in their hearts, they acted out upon. And so it starts with the mind, the thoughts. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down arguments, arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's not a suggestion. That is a commandment that we are to cast down our arguments. With who? Who are our arguments with? Usually God. We might think it's with someone else, but remember Paul said we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against what? Powers and principalities of the air. And, and, and when we are arguing about doing the right thing, we're arguing with God. Believe me. You're arguing with God. You're fighting against God, as it were. Paul thought he was doing the right thing by persecuting the early Christians, right? And he was standing by as they were stoning him. And what happened when he was on the road to Damascus and God stopped him? He says, Paul or Saul, why are you persecuting me? What? I'm not persecuting you, God. But he was persecuting God's people, which is in turn persecuting God. And didn't Jesus himself say, look, if, if you deny someone a drink of water, you're denying me. But if you give a drink of water to someone, you've given it unto me. And so there's that principle that what we do to one another, we're doing to God. We're doing to God. And so we need to take those arguments and we are to take every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And remember Peter talked about that Sunday, the knowledge of God. We need to understand who God is. We need to understand who Jesus is in order to have that divine nature of God. We need to take those knowledge that is against God and we need to cast them out, bringing them into the captivity, into the obedience of Jesus Christ, recognizing that it's wrong. What happens is, is that we begin to believe that it's right. As I said to you before, um, this young lady who felt that God wanted her happy, and God does. And so she started a ministry with the high school kids over here, and she fell in love with one of the high school boys and left her husband for the high school boy and felt because God wanted her happy that that was okay. And that is a thought, a knowledge of God that is wrong and she needs to recognize it and then cast it off and then be obedient to God and say that emotion and feeling is wrong. But she couldn't see that. She convinced herself that that was God. But see, she created her own God now. And she created an idol. And this idol acknowledges the fact that she should be happy so it doesn't matter how she gets it. Even if she violates the true God's ways, she made this idol. That's how deep it gets. That's how deep it gets. And so Paul tells us that we need to take our thoughts into captivity. The devil will lie to you. He will lie to you. Remember, he's that roaring lion. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. Remember Peter when Jesus said, look, I, I got to go to the cross, but in three days I'm going to resurrect. They're going to take me. They're going to bind me. They're going to, you know, pretty much abuse me. And what did Peter say? No way, Lord. And what did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan can give us thoughts. He will give us direction if we allow him to. So we need to bring those thoughts into captivity according to the word of God. That is your challenge. That is all of our challenge in our walk in life. Paul said in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now here's another commandment that we are not to be conformed to this world. Isn't that what happened with Israel? They were conformed to the culture. 
Well, that little tribe is worshiping a God. Why can't we worship a false God? And that tribe's worshiping that other God, and they're doing okay. Why can't we worship that God? And that guy's wearing those type of clothes. Why can't I wear those type of clothes? And everybody's doing that over here. Why can't I do that over here? You're conforming yourself to something. It's either to the Lord or it's to the world. What are you conforming yourself to? We are to conform ourselves to the Lord. And so we do it by renewing or transforming our mind. How do we do that? By reading the Word of God. Getting into the Word of God and seeing what God wants for us. And then we can tell what is good and acceptable and what the perfect will of the Lord is for our lives. We need to deny ourselves more and seek after God and be content with what God has given us. Why? Look at verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Boy, I remember, I've read that scripture I don't know how many times. And I remember reading that for the very first time. And I, when I read that, the Spirit just said, wow, in my heart. God's ways are way higher than yours, Reuben. God's thoughts are way higher than yours, Reuben. They are way beyond reaching. You know, I mean, you can't even think how and fathom how great God's thoughts are, not just towards you, but for you and the plans that he has and how it's going to all come about. They are so awesome, Reuben. And I still can't comprehend it all, but they are far above what I can think. And his ways are far better than my ways. My ways. In other words, my ways are wrong. My ways are futile. My ways are leading to dead ends. My ways are leading to corruption, to chaos, to confusion, to arguments and battles. Like James says, where do wars and and, and battles come from? Because we are selfish and we think about ourselves. And all that stuff is just garbage destroying us little by little. And the enemy is just laughing. He's just laughing. But when we realize that God's ways are better, and if I just submit myself to the Lord, then that's, that's more than I can even imagine what He is going to do. Can't even imagine it. The Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. And boy, they're not. And I'm glad they're not, right? Can you imagine if God's thoughts were our thoughts? <laughs> what this world would look like? If God thought like Obama, if God thought like some of our world leaders today, if God thought, uh, thought like the world thinks about money, boy, we'd be in worse trouble than we are now. If God thought like some of us, who would even be around if God thought like us? Because we could just get rid of anybody at any time if, we, if God thought like us, you know? If God was concerned about himself. That's interesting. You know that, that God's thoughts are not about himself? He doesn't think about himself. He's not doing any of this, these things for selfish reasons. These things are all being done for us, for you, to benefit you in every way of the form. That's how great his thoughts are towards us in his ways. So God doesn't think like us in no way or another. And we get in a lot of trouble when we expect that he should think like we do. Because that's what we expect. God, you should think like me. Why can't I have that thing? Why can't I do that? If you only thought like me, God doesn't act that way. He has better things for us. He, he does the things his way. I know we want him to do it our way, which, all, which is always a hard thing. Do it my way, Lord. Do it my way. No. Do it your way. <clears throat> oh boy, that's so applicable in so many different ways. You know, from ministry to to your home, for your work, you know, wherever you live. Ministry, doing it God's you know, way is so much better than doing it your way. <clears throat> I, I think of how God had given us this building in the ways that we thought we could do it. We thought about going to school. We looked into it, called the school district, started trying to draw plans on how we were going to bring the 
equipment there and back and set up and just all these things because we were losing the building. And, and the whole time, God already had a way planned. He already had another way to do it. I had no idea what it was, but we just knew. I remember when the guy, guy says, now, can you put down about $30,000? He says, you have the money, right? And I, I, I didn't say yes, and I didn't say no. I said, God has a lot of money, is what I said. We had zero. We had zero. Now, I was putting my trust that God's way was better. And so I just said, we don't have anything. I mean, I, I just told him, we, God has all the money that he needs, though we had nothing. And he kept asking me that, and I had no idea where we were going to get it. And then all of a sudden, this, this, the Lord just presented to us an opportunity to get $10,000 out uh, of our credit card. Zero percent for a whole year. So I took that opportunity, took 10000 out. So I had 10000 still needed twenty. And the guy kept asking, so you got the money, right? I'm like, God has all the money, but we had no money. And then at the last minute, when Pastor Chuck uh, said that he would hold the note and pay for it, the whole thing, and then the Lord tells me, no, I don't want him to, which is even harder to do because my way was to go to Chuck. You know, someone suggested, go to Chuck, tell him the story, he'll probably lend you the money. So that was the plan. And so um, now I'm in this plan. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to go to him. I was hesitant, but this individual knew Chuck personally and said, do it, and he'll lend you the money. And so with that in mind, away, I thought, okay, I called him up, and I couldn't believe that I got him, first of all. I mean, hello, Chuck was like that fast. And so I told him the whole story, and of course, he's now saying, my, my, let, let's, let us help you. We'll do it. We'll carry the note. What do you need? You know, what's the interest rate? Blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that whole thing. It was, it was done deal. It was, it was set in stone. And then all of a sudden the Lord says, no, I don't want to do that. I'm like, but wait a minute. He's already said that he would do it. In fact, we had some people say, he can't go back on his word. He already said he was going to do it. You know, yeah, but God has another way than our way. And so we didn't put Chuck in any burden, nor we put ourselves in any burden. And so the guy that was in first on, on a lean against this building, he said, oh, pastor, I'll tell you what, I'll lend you the money as long as I hold the note for one year. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll do that. So he lent us the money and he held the note and our payment dropped back down to $500 less than what we were paying. And it was like God's perfect plan. And then a year later, we went through the bank like a normal purchase would go through and our um, mortgage dropped in half on top of that without putting anything down but the 10000 that we pulled out. God's ways are better if we just trust in Him and know that He's going to do it. I have, I have seen people take a hold of things and try to manipulate, try to manipulate things, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And they're still manipulating. And that's not how you get growth. That's not how God works. You trust in Him in every which way. Because his ways are far higher. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, verse 9, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now think about that. Here we are in the earth. Look at the sky, but then look at the stars. And we are a galaxy, right? The earth, the sun is a galaxy. Then they say there's more galaxies out there. If not billions of galaxies on top of that. And God is saying, my ways are that higher. You can't even get to it. In fact, you have telescopes that can see so far. I'm, I'm farther than that. That's how better my ways are and my thoughts are. Spurgeon said, The difference and distance between God and man is revealed, not to discourage us from seeking Him, but to keep us humble as we seek Him. You may conclude that it is not intended that you should understand the infinite, for you are told that his thoughts and ways are far above yours, but you are required to seek him while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. We're not going to understand it, as Spurgeon said, but we're to trust in him. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth the bud that it may bring or give seed to the sower, the bread of the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper 
in the thing which I sent it. Now the question is, if his word will not return void, just like the waters, you know, you, you, the cloud drops the water, gone to the earth, goes to the moist, back to the ocean, clouds come, they bring up the moisture, and, they come, and it's a cycle, right? Just like that, so God's word has a purpose and a plan. It doesn't, it doesn't return to him void, empty. When his word goes out and it's being taught, there's a purpose behind it. Right now as it's being taught, it's either convicting you or it's pushing you away. And God is doing that in your life. He's allowing problems for you to deal with situations and he's doing that plan because that word's going to come back to him and it's going to accomplish what he wants to do. It's God's work in your life. Whether you like it or not, God is working in your life. God is going to continue to work until you get it right, until you hear Him, until you listen to Him. Otherwise, you will continue to fight in that cycle. That's what God did with Israel. That's why He kept after them. That's why they went into bondage and hopefully they woke up and then they started doing right again, worshiping right, sacrificing right, and God began to bless them again. And then all of a sudden they fall away, he'd start all over again, send persecution, send trials, kill a bunch of them, you know, if he had to do that, in order to get them back right with the Lord. That's what God does. That's his prerogative. He does as he pleases because he's God. That's hard for us to grasp and understand. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. See, I love it. I love it because that's how God works and I know how he works and I know that he's working a work. And so I can rejoice in the fact that he's doing that work and it's not me. As I said earlier on, I serve him and when I teach the word of God or if I counsel and give counsel, I know that I'm counseling from God's word and I can have faith that God will take that word and do what he wants. He'll either harden a person's heart with it and they'll get worse or he will enlighten them and they'll get better. But it's God's work, not my work. And so I can rejoice that the word went out. And oftentimes what happens is as you counsel people with the word of God is they don't want to hear the word of God. And so they go from person to person to hear somebody that will agree with them. And once they find someone that agrees with them, ah, they're my friend. I like them. Let me get more counsel from them because they agree with me. And now you've created a a bad situation. You're not listening to the Word of God. You're not thirsting the Word of God. You're thirsting the Word of man. And you're thirsting your own way and your own thoughts. And that's where we run into trouble. You've got to be open to hear what the Lord, of of the Word of the Lord says and to be corrected by the Lord a, a child of God gets corrected by the Lord. Otherwise, he's not a child of God. For you, shall go out, for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. You can almost imagine that, the trees clapping their hands and rejoicing and so forth. Instead of the thorn uh, shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the bear shall come up the myrtle tree. It And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So when God's people turn to Him, when they truly turn to Him and they thirst for Him, and they're really truly listening to Him and to His Word, there's going to be that joy and peace. There's going to be that blessing. There's going to be that rejoicing. Just as the trees would rejoice, so you will rejoice in your life when you submit yourself to the will of the Lord the blessings of God. You remember the story in, in the Old Testament, I believe it was in in Numbers, it may have been in Leviticus, but there's the cursing, maybe it's Deuteronomy, the cursing and the blessings. And he told the children of Israel to go on each side and to pronounce the curses and the blessings. And they're very clear as they do it. And so they pronounce the blessings and so God began to say, if you do this, I will bless you. But if you do this, I will curse you. In other words, I will correct you. He still is doing that today. Hebrews says that God corrects his children because he loves us. A man will sow his seeds and then he will reap the consequences of what he's sown. That's a principle of God. And if you sow to the flesh, then you're going to reap the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you reap to the spirit. The cursings or the blessings. It's all up to us. But Know this for sure, God loves you, and he will not forsake you. 
And he's working the work in your life because his thoughts and ways are far higher than yours. And so he's working in you. You may not see it. You may think it's not fair and it's not right, but he's doing it because he's going to do what he pleases because he loves you that much.